Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here talking to you about our recent journey we've been on on creating a new digital product, the biggest we've ever launched in the VNA's history. It's called Explore the Collections. It's in beta phase at the moment, which means it's not completely finished, but it's take, we've taken a massive step in finally bringing together the collections data that the VNA holds around its 1.2 million objects, as well as the stories behind those objects. And I'm going to take you on some of that journey we've recently experienced. But firstly, I'm going to take you back to the late 1990s. So in the late 1990s, I was actually at the VNA because I was studying on an MA in history of design. And we were tasked with taking, choosing an object from the VNA collections and researching about that object. I was really interested in the work of Eileen Gray. As fans of modernism and modernist architecture and interior design will know, Eileen Gray was one of the greats of the last century. And she produced an incredible range um, of interior uh, designs and objects. And in particular, I was interested in a chair she made called the Espen chair. So this was the beginning of my journey. Um, this was called Rolo. It was a, a system that the IT team at the VNA had made. And it stood for recording object locations online. So at the late 90s, we were really interested in getting objects onto the internet. And this was a really, really simple system. Uh, in fact, lots of the data you see online at the VNA was originally put into this system. And this system had its constraints because you had less space than a tweet to describe an object. So you can see that immediately there was a, a real limitation that though we were using digital systems, the uh, constraints around those systems meant that the uh, information wasn't as fulsome as it might otherwise have been. So this led me onto a journey to find uh, more paper records, more traditional records. So I had to work out where in the VNA I needed to go. There are seven miles of galleries. It was quite daunting as a student to find your way around. In fact, it still is, it is, still is today. Um, and eventually I found the furniture department. And in the furniture department, I found a bunch of Rolodex cards, index cards. And these gave me a little bit more information about this object. And this object, unfortunately, was not available for me to view at the VNA because it was a long, on a long term loan to Dublin. And at the time, it meant that um, when I was looking for further information or to see the object, all I had were these uh, card index cards that you see before me because if I went online um, I would see the website and this was the VNA's first website in fact I think it was one of the first museum websites um, to appear on the internet and that was back in 1996 it was very rudimentary as most websites were back then it had one image which you can see here um, and interestingly, the information architecture isn't completely different from what we have today, but obviously the presentation of that information is radically different. We did have some information about our collections online back in 1996, and it gave a good overview of the different departments, the different collecting departments and the sorts of materials that were contained within them. Unfortunately for me, there was no information about the S-Bend chair by Eileen Gray. So I had to do a lot more research outside the VNA to find out what I needed to know about this fascinating chair and the stories behind it. So if we move forward 10 years, say, what would that journey look like in the late noughties? Well, by this point in 2008, there was a beta for what was called Search the Collections. Again, it was a rudimentary interface. Even then, I think um, user interfaces tend to look a little bit more sophisticated than this. Um, but at this point, you had 30,000 objects available online. So we were quite late to the party in terms of getting our collections data online, although we'd made some really important foundational steps in the late 90s. We certainly hadn't got most of our objects online uh, by any means. In fact, just a small fraction of them. A year later, um, Search the Collections itself was launched and you can see a, a, a real leap in terms of the user experience of this um, product. It shows a nice uh, array of um, images on the landing page and it allowed people to search for objects with a very powerful search. So for me at this point, I could go in and type in Eileen Gray, S-Bend chair, and this is what I would find. 
And here we found some information. Uh, we would see some information about the summary of the object itself and two pictures. I'll take you on a little journey down the page. There's not much more than you can see in the original screen grab. In terms of the overall design, I'd say there's a lot to be desired um, in terms of user experience, but at least the information was there. So if I'd been doing my studies 10 years later, I would have found a lot more than I could find on that very simple internal database, as well as this, uh, the index cards. And here are two images for me to choose from. So that was my, that would be my journey in the late noughties. Um, and this is me and my experience as a student, um, looking at this fascinating piece of material culture. But what about other people who use the collections online? Um, sorry, before I go there, this is, this is just a snapshot of what the website looked like back then as well. And you can see, again, pretty functional. There are a few stories here, but not many about some of the key highlight objects. Um, but again, though I could find more collections data online, I wouldn't be able to find any stories from the VNA about that chair. So this is where my journey would have ended. So this was one example uh, use case, mine uh, as a student, but we wanted to find out when we began our journey, what, what do people other than me want and need from our collections online? So just to give you a bit of context, um, Search the Collections, which you just saw, receives about 1.7 million sessions a year. And there's also collections content on the main site. This is all the editorial content, the rich story-led content on the main website that receives about 3.6 million sessions. So there's immediately an opportunity here to join what are currently, what were currently two, then two silos. One is all the collections data that sits in Search the Collections, and two is the main website with all the wonderful stories on it. And what we found interesting was during closure, our collections content performed extremely well with a 15% increase in page views. And I'm sure many of you experienced similar sorts of increases in browsing activity. So when we started this journey a few years ago, we began by asking who is using our collections online? And what became really interesting to us um, was that Actually, most people are there for personal interest. Um, they're about 40% of the audience. And actually, if you combine those coming for professional and academic reasons, they share a similar proportion. So it was certainly a product that was designed for researchers and professional users. It wasn't built for people who just have a casual interest in art and design. And they were actually the biggest part of our audience. And there was also a small percentage using our collections online to help them plan a visit, but the existing product did little to help them with that journey. And we also asked about people's levels of knowledge. And what became really interesting to us was, of course, those who are coming for academic reasons have a lot of specialist knowledge, as you can see in that top bar in orange. They have a considerable grounding, as one might imagine, in the history of art and design. Uh, again, those coming for professional reasons are also very specialist. But what you see when you look at those who have personal interest, which is the biggest, biggest percentage of the audience, they have little specialist knowledge. Yet what we designed in the late uh, noughties, back in 2009, was a product that was really good at catering for specialists and those with specialist knowledge, but not so much for people with very little specialist knowledge and more of an enthusiast level of knowledge or general level of knowledge um, when it came to the history of art and design. We also asked about people who were coming, this biggest chunk of the audience, people visiting for personal interest reasons, why are you here? And overwhelmingly they said they were here just to look at art and design. So this whole visual experience is again another interesting thought that we took on in terms of uh, developing our overall design approach to explore the collections. And most people are there, as we found out, to look and look at or learn about art and design and to be inspired for their own work. And this idea of inspiration became really, really important and came out very loud and clear with all the user research that we did. For those visiting for academic reasons, it comes as no surprise, they're here for research, but also to be inspired. And for those visiting for professional reasons, again, research was a really important motivation for them, as well as inspiration. And then we asked, what are the specific areas of interest 
for users across all of our sites. And we found out overwhelmingly people were interested in a specific object, but also they're interested in periods in time. They're interested in styles and art movements and they're interested in materials and techniques. But what we had with Search the Collections was an interface designed primarily based on individual objects. And so we thought this was a really interesting insight that we could start to grow out these different themed pages that tackled styles and people and materials. So that was the broad quantitative survey. We then started doing some in-depth user research, testing with people who um, come for these various different reasons, for professional reasons, for personal interest reasons. And we started to develop four modes. And these modes were understand, explore, develop and research. So in understand mode, we have people who are just becoming aware of the V&A's collections and of the museum, and they might be here to plan a visit. Then we have people in explore mode. They're here to be exposed to new ideas and want to be inspired. And then those in develop mode are working on a project. They've got their own particular idea. They want to push further. Uh, and they are adding to their existing knowledge by looking at what material we have online. Their behavior is characterized by sideways sort of journeys across our website, as well as going deeper into some object information. And then we have research. And these are people who are looking for detailed information on specific topics. So actually for me back in my MA history of design days, I was in develop mode when I was looking for broad information about Eileen Gray and her, and her interior design work, as well as research where I wanted to go deep into the object history of the S Pen chair. And what we found was we were catering really well to those in research mode who were looking for detailed information. They know exactly what to put in a search box, but the rest of these modes were really uh, uncatered for. We weren't really serving the needs of those in these different modes of understand, explore and develop. So what does the what do these modes look like? How do they help us with the design process? We this is an example of those in develop mode. So these are people working on their design projects or looking for inspiration. They could be people who are in the professional arts. They might be architects or designers or costume or set designers, for example. And you can see here various spectrums of where they sit on a spectrum of familiarity with the museum or of familiarity with the particular topic they're looking at, how much research experience they've got, and whether they're looking for something specific. And here you see a quote directly from one of the people we interviewed. And they're looking to be taken to things that they might not have thought of going to. So this is different to those in research who have a very high level of intent. In development mode, people are curious to find out what's next, what's new, what's connected with their interests. And then we have example quotes here. So people in this mode love just going down a rabbit hole of beautiful stuff. They're really image led. They, they know that images are the most important tool in their research. We also found that they find copyright quite confusing as do we all. Um, they, want to be, it, they want it to be very clear what they can and they can't use. Um, but also an expectation that everything the VNA does has to be absolutely perfect um, and it generally is which makes us nervous when we're putting out a beta, which is not the finished product. Um, but we know that if we can deliver some value early on to these users, um, i.e. get a product out quicker that services their needs, hopefully that will help um, cater to their needs in a way we can't currently and that they'll bear with us as we make it all perfect in the coming months. Um, but it sets the expectations very high for anything that we do. So how do we use these modes? Well, we develop user stories and these user stories get fed into the design and development process. So for example, somebody wants to be able to search for copyright free images. Somebody in develop mode wants to search for copyright free images so they know they can use them in their projects. And also they want to, when they have a look at a collection online, they want to be able to search within that collection so they don't waste time browsing through things that aren't relevant. So, I won't go through all of them, but it gives you a sense of how we take these user insights to then feed directly into the design and development process and also into the content development process. So here, the, the needs of people in this mode are really clear. 
They want written content that can add context to a piece of art or an artist and can inspire them to take new directions in their work. And visual content is really the most important element for these people, but they also then want to go into deeper content at a later date. They're also interested in basic levels of information, but their focus is absolutely on the story. And so what began as a hunch that we needed to start bringing together the stories with the object data became verified through the user research that we did. So what's changed? We developed a mission um, in creating a new product that moved search the collections on into new territory, which we called Explore the Collections, which brings together BNA objects and stories to inspire people to develop their own creativity to understand and research over 1 million eclectic objects. And this mission became our North Star when we were designing and developing Explore the Collections. Everything that we did, we checked if it really helped us deliver on this mission. And we also developed some ob objectives around this mission. We wanted to make the collections accessible to all, like most museums and galleries and public institutions. It's our duty, in fact, to make our collections accessible. But we really wanted to unpack what we meant by accessibility, not just website accessibility, but thinking about how we can tell stories about the collections to really open them up to more people. We also wanted to encourage creativity in making. And that's really hard, at the heart of the BNA mission. Uh, we have over 42% of people in coming to the museum itself and online um, are makers and want to make uh, beautiful objects of art and design. And we want to help fuel their own creativity. We also wanted to present imagery in new and better ways. Imagery came out as something very, very important for all users in all modes that we needed to do a better job of showing this rich cultural heritage that our collections represent. We also wanted to help people discover more objects and stories, not just through search, but thinking about more intuitive ways to discover collections, our collections online. And in terms of delivering on all those objectives, we thought we could really help deliver on our fifth and final objective, which is to grow our audience beyond our sector. We knew that our collections are accessed online by specialists, by people who know and love the VNA, but we knew we've got the potential to grow that audience significantly. So we started off uh, looking at our information architecture. I won't go through the detail here, but it just gives you an idea of how we approach creating new page types and thinking about the user journeys that will connect these different page types. It's also um, unrealistic to think that people come in through the top navigation on our website, which is forward slash collections, and then they travel down through these different pages. Most people, in fact, come right at the bottom there on the object pages, 75% of people come on an object page having landed there from search. So our job was to better connect these different page types to make sure that people don't end up on a silo on an object page and just disappear. So the exit rates were something that we were looking at to see if we can decrease to show that people are actually finding more interesting stuff and continuing their journey across this overall architecture. Here's an example of what we've ultimately done, and this is connecting what we call a contextual page, in this case, a page about underwear. And you can see how we've now started joining up uh, this contextual page on the main website with its collection highlights. It shows objects from the underwear collections and it shows editorial content. And we know this is how lots of people encounter our collections online. But what we want to do is take them over to the object data itself that was formerly housed in Search the Collection. So this was the first piece of glue that we'd made, a way to browse this collections grid. And if you're a person who is interested in this girdle, for example, you now land on the new object page on what was Search the Collections that's now called Explore the Collections. And you can immediately see we now have, as well as the object data, we have this editorial content about that corset as well as all the rich collections information that's now been categorized in much more fluid ways. Um, and you've got this feature here called You May Also Like that allows you to take a visual search through our collections, either through other girdles or through other pieces of underwear in this case. And it's a way for people to take horizontal journeys across the collections. I'll explain a bit more about what you're seeing shortly. But to go into more detail, this is what the object page used to look like on Search the Collections. These are some of the most important collections uh, objects, which is the uh, miraculous draft of fishes, one of the 
Raphael cartoons, they're giant canvases that were preparatory sketches for the tapestries that exist in the Vatican. And these are very, you know, incredible objects with very rich stories around them. And these object pages weren't really, in our opinion, doing much justice. You didn't get a sense of the size of these uh, incredible artworks. You didn't get much of the story. And this is what these look like now in Explore the Collection. So immediately you can see a much, um, a prioritization of the rich imagery around these objects. But also you can see we've included in these um, story areas here, some of the wonderful stories about the Raphael cartoon. So I'll take you on what that page looks like. As you go down the page, you can see that the images are sticky so that as you're looking through object data, you can continually reference the images on your right hand side, they drop down the page. And here's the um, art editorial content that I mentioned. And then a much clearer signposting to other data that is ordered, organized around the taxonomies that exist in our collections database. And also an opportunity to suggest feedback about this object record. Again, you can also look through other objects in the collection that relate to Raphael. And that's another way to take you on a journey horizontally from Raphael to, for example, objects connected through the collection, in this case, onto a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. And then search. Search has been a really important feature of Search the Collections, and with Explore the Collections, we've not abandoned it. Um, it was very powerful search before. Um, this is an example if you were looking through China, it would um, give you anything tagged China in our collections, but this I haven't got a video here, but this would ask you first if you were looking for China the material or China the place. And hopefully you can see here we've done a better job here of concertinaing some of the data together, the information, so that you expand only those categories you're interested in rather than seeing everything in a giant list on the left hand side. It's got a very powerful filtering process. So instead of having an advanced search button, as we had on the left hand side, we now have a phased journey that allows you to make it incrementally more advanced as you progress through your journey. But it's a much more organized way of showing search, but still powered uh, through very, yeah, through, still powered through a really powerful elastic search at the back end. Very briefly, we've also, and one of the reasons we wanted to get our beta out quickly was to um, deal with some of the more offensive, uh, problematic records in our collection. And so we've created a series of design patterns that help protect people from some of the more problematic areas, whether they are imagery or whether they're the words contained with the image, within the images, or in fact, the object's description that might have been written in the past. In fact, oh, many of our object records were written pre-internet and they might be taken from Victorian records and written in a way that um, is now offensive to contemporary eyes. Um, so whilst we're going back and updating lots of our records and bearing in mind there are several million of them, it's going to take some time. We use this feature to help us um, alert users to any sort of offensive material. Um, and so you can see here on the top left what that looks like in the search results, um, either as the image, the image view on search results or the listings view on the bottom left. And then when we've actually grayed out the actual image so that you have a piece of friction that we've in, uh, actively in, introduced here so that people have to consciously decide to see this image and also a warning uh, prominently at the top of the page. Yes. And so I think... Uh, we're kind of uh, running out of time, uh, but you can have, uh, if you want a brief few seconds to round, up, round it up, uh, please do so, and we'll have some questions from the audience as well. No problem. I will whiz through the feedback. Basically, lots of lovely feedback. Um, I won't go into detail, um, but people have really realized that um, this has helped them take them on lots of journeys down the rabbit hole, just as we set out to do and lots of feedback on the work we've done with the data itself and also on the design and UX. So I won't show you what that Eileen Gray chair looks like now. I'll save the time for questions. You can go off to explore the collections, uh, hit collections on the main navigation and have a look yourself. And this goes one step further to solving the William Morris problem. The William Morris problem being that if you're interested in William Morris at the VNA, his the data around him is uh, currently housed in nine different systems we've taken a massive step forward in at least bringing together the data from two of those systems, 
the object data in the collections management system and the editorial stories around the rich stories of 5,000 years of human history that's contained within the VNA website. I shall end it there and reserve some time for questions.